Good evening, everyone. Uh, please bear with us as we get everyone online, but we should be starting very shortly. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the Midlands launch of the eighth annual British Seek Report. Uh, we were initially planning to launch the British Seek Report as we normally do in the spring, uh, and we were looking forward to joining you in Birmingham and doing it in the, uh, the council rooms there. Unfortunately, the impact of the pandemic has been huge and it's meant that we were unable to have the launch in the usual way. We've also delayed our launch by six months in the hope that we could still have a live event. Um, little did we know that we'd still be in the grips of the pandemic six months after the event, but that's where we are. So like everything or virtually everything this year, we've decided to have the launch of the BSI in that very 2020 way by Zoom. Um, we're thankful to our supporting partners namely the NHS uh, Blood and Transplant Service, City Seeks, and the Seek Assembly. We've come a long way since our very first report back in 2013, and we've always endeavoured to provide robust, reliable data about the British Seek community from our very beginnings. So why are documents like the British Seek report of such significance? The simple answer is that people like numbers. It makes it easier to understand the specific issues affecting any particular community. And this year, we've focused on a variety of diverse and uh, topical issues. Issues ranging from organ donation through to disability and disability awareness, the impact that loneliness has on so many people's lives, marriage and weddings, relationship and sex education in schools, accommodation, and also voting uh, in the 2019 December election. So, a lot, of co uh, a lot of issues and subjects which have been covered by this. Uh, as ever, we've been assisted by an amazing team of dedicated volunteers, and you'll be hearing from one of them later. Um, and many of them have joined us this evening as attendees. As you read through the pages of the British Seek Report, I'm certain you'll find and discover aspects of the British Seek community that you'll find interesting, intriguing, and perhaps even surprising. It reflects the true diversity of the British Seek community. And we hope that this information will help guide policymakers, charities and public bodies, as well as the Sikh community itself, when it comes to issues affecting British Sikhs in the challenging times ahead. Um, I'm now going to be passing you on very shortly to uh, our editor, who is Jigdev Singh Verdi. Uh, Jigdev is the editor of the British Sikh Report. He's a former deputy director at the Office for National Statistics. He's a fellow of the Royal Statistical Society and a member of the UK National Statistics Advisory Group. 
So uh, I'm just going to hand you over now to uh, Jigdev. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Right. Good evening, everybody. Um, what I'm going to do, uh, firstly, thank you, Jasmine, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to whiz through some of the results of the report and a bit of the background to how we uh, compile it or how we get the data and so on, and then hand over to uh, Kuljeet, who's going to talk, who's one of our sections of authors, and we'll be talking about uh, some aspects of the report. So here we go. Um, one of the first things that I'd like to uh, mention is that um, in compiling this report, uh, with my background in official statistics, I try to apply the principles that are applied with official statistics through the code of practice, um, which is overseen by the UK Statistics Authority. And key principles of that are that the statistics that you produce should be trustworthy, that people should have confidence uh, in the organization and the people who produce the data. So we have a, a team of professionals with a good deal of experience who are involved in producing the report. Secondly, there should be high quality. So both the data and the methods uh, produce statistics that are of assured quality. And then value that the statistic should support what society needs. Uh, we're not just producing statistics for the sake of it, but they cover topics and issues that are relevant to society. And in our case, particularly uh, relevant to the Sikh community in the UK. Um, the survey this year was primarily can, instead of conducted online through social media, emails and uh, lists and websites, and also through various Sikh and Punjabi organizations, um, and also through Gurdwaras and community groups. Um, we need to point out that data collected this year was between December 2019 and March, just into April 2020. So it was collected before the COVID lockdowns. Um, as just we explained earlier, because we were so busy with other aspects of managing uh, the pandemic, the production of the report got delayed, but it doesn't reflect a lot of what happened during this pandemic. And our aim would be that the next report will look back on this year and people's experiences of COVID will clearly be a key topic. Um, so as the responses come in uh, to the report, we monitor them to make sure that they're represented by age, by gender, by marital status and region. So I'm sort of normally monitoring that throughout that three, four months while the data are coming in um, to make sure that the survey is representative. And we normally get a shortfall in the elderly through these online methods. So we try to fulfill that by uh, going out with paper forms to day centers for the elderly and the Gurdwaras. All the responses are thoroughly quality assured and we do reject quite a few responses because people have put in just you know, some sometimes just uh, uh, funny responses that are not actually valid, but we have methods for sifting out um, and this that happens in all surveys that are uh, sort of undertaken by any organization. So the resulting sample that we have uh, of, of good quality satisfactory responses this year is 2700 which is once again the highest ever. Um, last year was 2,500, the year before was just over 2,000. So each year actually over the eight years, the sample has been increasing. And we are grateful to all the team members who are listed on page 53 of the report. Um, the whole report is put together by volunteers yeah, in the spirit of Seva and everybody gives up their own valuable time. So the topics covered this year um, include organ donation, voting in the general election, which happened in December, um, accommodation where people live, whether you own your house or rent it. Uh, we looked at crime and fear of crime, marriages and weddings and cost of weddings, uh, um, teaching of relationships and sex education in schools. Um, we looked at Sikh faith schools around the country um, people's uh, views about whether there should be uh, one in their area and so on. We looked at disability, loneliness, connection with Punjab in India, and some key issues of concern to people regarding Punjab, for example, drug abuse, uh, and we looked at arts. 
We continue to connect data on uh, other issues such as identity, ethnicity, um, the five Ks, whether some if people are wearing the star, whether the Amritari, and also basic demographic information. And all of that is used to then look at differences in opinion of different age groups and gender and so on. So now we get into the highlights of the results of some of those topics. Um, so firstly, we asked whether you are practicing Amrattari or not. And 11% of respondents said that they're Amrattari. And there's quite a difference between age groups with 25% of the over 65s said they're Amrattari, but lower percentage in other uh, age categories. And some of the results we then break down into the views of people who are Amrattari and those who are not. Um, looking at the general election um, results, which had happened just as we started collecting the data in December, um, it was quite pleasing to see high turnout that 78% of respondents said that they did vote for a particular party, 9% said they didn't vote, and 13% said they didn't want to say how or whether they voted. So the actual response could be somewhat higher than 78 which is actually quite pleasing that uh, people are participating in uh, the political process there. Um, looking at the actual declaration of how people voted, um, we had 45% said that they voted for Labour, 22% Conservative, 6% Lib Dems and 3% Greens. But if you look at the top chart, um, on the left, the red bars represent the vote, Labour vote, and on the right, the blue bars represent uh, the Conservative vote. And going uh, from the top down, it's the youngest age group going down to the oldest age group. And you'll see that uh, the Labour vote goes down with age, uh, and the Conservative vote goes up with age. And that actually reflects the pattern in the lower chart, which is for all voters, the whole population, where the top one is just for six. Uh, so that age pattern is re replicated, although it's at different levels. So there's a higher conservative vote in the general population than the six, but the age pattern is very similar. Um, looking at gender differences, so 14% of Sikh women and 31% of men voted conservative. So that's quite a big difference between the gender. Um, 50% Sikh women and 39% men voted Labour. So there is a rather a gender split. Um, and again, there is a, this, the difference in the general population is in the same direction, although not so uh, large a difference. Turning to crime and fear of crime, we asked, have you or your family ever directly experienced any hate crimes in the UK? And we asked about two time periods, either before 2016, before the Brexit vote, and after, because there was a bit of a shift in uh, hate crimes at that time. And that the majority said that they hadn't suffered hate crime directly, uh, either before or after 2016. But those who say that they have reduces by age, so that there's a higher percentage of younger victims. But on the other hand, fear of crime, 9% were very worried or 29% uh, were fairly worried uh, overall, but that rose from 3% for those aged under 19 to 19% for those aged 65 or over. So actual reporting of crime goes down by age, but the fear of crime rises by age, which is an interesting sort of difference. Next, we turn to marriages, and we asked people whether they're married. Two thirds of British Sikh adults are married, compared with half, about 50% for UK as a whole. Um, and the marriage rate increases by age. So it's 35% for those aged 20 to 34, compared with 90% for those aged 65 or over. Um, we asked how people had met their partner or spouse, and 44% said that they'd had arranged marriages, um, but that again varied by age. So it was just 13% for those aged 20 to 34, going up to 80% for those who are aged 65 plus. And the opposite trend is there for what you might call love marriages, which is highest in younger ages. And Amrathari Sikhs are more likely to have arranged marriage at 63% compared with 44% for Sikhs as a whole. 
we asked people about the costs of weddings, um, which is the big issue, uh, increasing sort of issue in recent years. Um, and the top chart shows for each of four broad age groups, so 20 to 34, 35 to 49, 50 to 64, and 65 and over. So there are four blocks of charts. And within each block, uh, you've got 10,000 pound bands. So the, the last block with a very tall blue um, sort of bar, what that shows is for those age 65 plus, two thirds of the weddings, they said cost under 10,000 pound, and nearly all of them are below 30,000. And that reflects that their wedding may have been many, many years ago. It may have been in India or another country where they came from. Whereas at the younger age end, the first block of uh, bars, the 20 to 34 year olds, the costs extend from under 10,000 to over 100,000. So quite a, quite a difference uh, by age band. And the other two age bands are sort of moving towards the higher end. Uh, so the gradual sort of change. Um, we asked what was the most expensive part of your wedding? And again, there was an age difference. Historically, uh, for the older age group, it was the Anandakaraj and the lunch and the breakfast at the Gurdwara. Um, for some, a few, the honeymoon was the most expensive part. Um, but nowadays, the wedding reception is the most expensive part. And also, uh, we've got another chart that's not here, but in the um, actual report, that Amrathari spent much less, 50% uh, of them had weddings costing less than £10,000. Um, turning to relationships and sex education in schools, the majority do support the teaching of um, relationship and sex education in school, but this that support declines with age. Um, we look, we asked about various family types, and the patterns are very similar. So there are two family types that are shown in this. The top one is about single parent families, and the lower chart is about same sex parent uh, families. Um, then. In, in the top one, 90% of younger groups and two thirds of the oldest group uh, gave, gave support for teaching of sex education and family uh, types. But there's lower support from males and also lower support from Amrathari Sikhs. And between the two family types, so the, the pattern was similar, but at a, a lower level for same sex parent families. Um, now, there have been some protests outside schools, um, particularly I think in the Midlands, uh, about the teaching of uh, sex education in schools. And so we asked about what people's views are about those protests. Now, the majority don't agree um, with the protests, but there's more agreement from men than from women, um, as the lower chart shows. Um, Turning to Sikh faith schools, we asked whether there's a Sikh faith school in your area. And 52% of Sikhs in the survey said that they do have a faith school in their area. And 64% of Amrataris live near a Sikh faith school. Now this partly uh, shows the concentration of Sikhs in certain areas. Um, because a large part of the Sikh population is concentrated either in the, the West Midlands or parts of London um, or the towns like Slough. And uh, there you have got schools in existence. So a large part of the population does live near, but then the rest of the population is uh, spread out across the rest of the country where there aren't any schools. Um, so this is partly reflecting that, that although it might seem like a high percentage, that 52%, but it's actually, uh, I think it does reflect reality. Um, and it was also interesting to note that 64% of Amrataris actually say they live near a Sikh school. They might either have chosen to live in the sort of area where there are Sikh schools uh, or some other reason, but it is certainly higher for Amrathari families. Um, we also asked then, do you think that there should be a Sikh faith school in your area? And again, the majority, more than half, 54%, would like a Sikh faith school in their area. And there's higher support from males and from Amrathari Sikhs. Um, now, th this, uh, this ch these charts are not in the report. This is very provisional. I've just done this little bit of analysis today just for this presentation because we're looking at uh, we're, uh, talking about Midlands today. Um, we generally haven't published any uh, breakdowns by regions. Um, 
so far because we feel that the sample size is not big enough to produce a, a good results for any individual region. But what we've done here is look at um, created a region called the Greater Southeast, which is London, the Southeast and Eastern region, then the Midlands, which is East and West Midlands combined, and then the rest of the UK. Um, and looking at those, 67% um, of rep the respondents in Midlands say that they live near a Sikh school, and 57% in the Greater Southeast, uh, largely reflecting the situation in London and uh, towns like Slough, which are in the Southeast. Uh, but it's only 20% in the rest of the country. Um, and two thirds of respondents, on the other hand, want a Sikh faith school in the area. And that's actually a very similar percentage across all three uh, sort of sub regions of the UK. We asked about what are your the factors that you take into account for choosing the school for your children. And although people have said that they would like faith school in their area, the, the top reason for cho making choice of the school is educational achievement. That is the most important reason. 75% people said that. Secondly was location and proximity and the facilities at the school was third. So the faith ethos actually comes in at number seven. So it's imp important, but not enough. So highest high quality education is the most important factor. Um, we asked about disability and types of disabilities that those who are uh, disabled uh, have. Now, half of those with disabilities say that they have a physical impairment. 18% uh, say mental health. And then there are various other categories uh, that people uh, mentioned, such as uh, hearing impairment, visual, autism, learning disability and communication. And complex health needs is actually 7%, which, which is quite significant. Uh, we had uh, disabled in all age groups, but the highest uh, are in the oldest age group, 17% in those aged 65 and over. Um, we asked those who are disabled whether they receive any assistance from social services or other organisations. Now, half of them said that they were looked after by their family. A quarter have some assistance, whether it's uh, from carers through community or voluntary organisations or through social services or privately organized carers. And uh, only 19% say that they have some respite care. Um, so that's, I think, quite a, a stark finding that uh, little respite care and a, a lot are looked after by the family. We asked about loneliness. Uh, how often do you feel that you lack companionship? And the first chart is made down by age. Um, and the young say that they feel most lack of companionship. And then the second chart uh, shows looking at it by marital status, uh, which, which is intuitively it's right that those in relationships are the least lonely. So whether they're married or civil partnered, and then those who are most uh, lonely, are those who are divorced and separated um, or single for other reasons or widowed. Um, you asked about issues of concern in Punjab, which, which, which issues are of most concern to you? Um, now, we should note again, this survey was taken, uh, the questions were devised last November, so we went out in December. So some issues that have arisen during this year uh, were not known about at that time, such as the Kisan issue. Um, so these are issues that were, uh, were relevant at the time of the data collection. And the issue that was most highest uh, of concern is the drugs and alcohol. Secondly was corruption. And then thirdly, environment and then human rights. Uh, so so uh, quite a few issues of concern. Um, but there are other aspects of this issue that are reported on in the report. Um, turning to organ donation, on which we have an article in the report and uh, others will talk about uh, this issue afterwards. The, the law changed this year um, so that uh, an opt-out system came in rather than opting in. Um, and in the survey, 51% said that they were aware of the law change. The highest awareness is among 50 to 64-year-olds at 59%, but the awareness does decrease in the younger age groups. Um, and there was higher awareness among females compared with males. We asked whether people are happy to we automatically assumed to be a donor. Um, and 62% said that uh, they are. 
seventeen percent that they're not happy, uh, and but there was a similar level of support from both males and females. We also asked whether people consider organ donation to be a form of seva after passing away, and sixty-seven percent said that they do consider organ donation to be a form of seva, and that was very similar for both males and females. Um, we asked whether people have discussed their wishes regarding organ donation with their families, but um, even if under the opt-out system, families could still object to their loved one's organs being uh, taken after they pass away. And 34% uh, have discussed organ donation and their wishes with the family, so just a third. It does rise with age, so 40% of those age 65 and over. Um, and 30% uh, of females overall uh, compared with 38% rather of females compared with 30% of males. So that, that's uh, all that I'm going to be talking about. Um, other colleagues will be talking about other topics. So I'm going to hand over back to Jasweer now. Thank you, Jigdeer. Um, I It's always wonderful to see, see those statistics to hear what the, the figures are for the various uh, matters that you've outlined. And I think it's also important for us to remember that this is a, a team collective. It's the British Seat Report team who helped to gather the data, who helped to produce the report and analyze the data in the way that they do. Um, I'm going to ask, first of all, uh, Pat McFadden to, uh, to say a few words. I understand that he needs to leave slightly before the end. So I'll ask Pat to speak at this stage. Pat is the MP for Wolverhampton South East, and he is also uh, the uh, Secretary for State, um, sorry, Shadow Economic Secretary to the Treasury, Pat. Thank you very much, Jasby, and thanks to Doug Dev for taking us through the, the conclusions of, of the report. Um, I just wanted to say I'm really pleased to be with you for some of tonight. I've been involved with the British Sikh report, I guess almost since its beginning, Jasbir. If not, then, then pretty close to it. And I've been pleased to host the launch uh, in the House of Commons uh, a number of times. And it's very sad that we have to do everything in this way this year. I think the report is very valuable for policymakers because it gives us a very rigorously produced uh, rolling picture of opinion in the community on different issues. And one of the great things about the report is it adapts year by year and asks new questions maybe that we haven't covered in, in previous years. Uh, and as Jagdev said, uh, and I don't propose to repeat what he said, some really interesting findings this year on things like organ donation, the attitude to faith schools, the attitude to sex and relationship education, uh, and also things like, like loneliness and, and disability. And I'll be fascinated to see next year's report, which I'm sure will delve into the community's experience of COVID and everything that we've had to go through with um, working at home, with lockdowns, with trying to keep businesses going, uh, with all the different aspects of uh, of this, so it's it's of huge value to to see this, and I just want to commend uh, everybody who's been responsible for producing this. And I take what Jagdev said very seriously about the statistical rigor of the report, because that's really important to the credibility of what's produced. So that's really valuable here. Um, and just one story which comes after the report to, to share with you, uh, which I think is a, a, a positive story, is that as we speak this week uh, in my Wolverhampton constituency, uh, we are uh, experimenting and rolling out these new lateral flow uh, COVID tests. This is a quick 15 to 30 minute test. Uh, and the main place that it's been done is in the Guru Nanak Sikh Gurdwara in Sedgwick Street. So it's a really good example of a very positive partnership between the local authority, our great 
public health director, uh, John Denley, who's really served the city well uh, through the past year and the local Sikh community. And as everybody in the call knows, um, when there's a crisis, the Sikh community likes to come together and help out. And I want to thank everybody on this call and throughout the country who's uh, stepped up and done things like food production and delivery through the COVID crisis in Wolverhampton. We've had a fantastic community response from the Sikh community, Christian community, all parts, churches, voluntary organisations. It's been great to see. So I'm really pleased to have been able to, to come to join with you uh, tonight. I'll stay for a bit longer, but partly because of that uh, front bench responsibility you mentioned, Jasbir, we're going into committee on quite a complicated financial services bill tomorrow, and I've got quite a lot of homework to do tonight. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll need to uh, go and, and focus on that at some point. But thanks very much to, to all of you for asking me to be with you tonight. It's a real pleasure. I think it's a great report. And I think that doing this every year is a service not only to the Sikh community, but for, for the wider uh, policy and, and public debate. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your, for your kind words and also for your continuing support. It's, uh, I think you've hosted us on several occasions at the House of Commons and it's always been a pleasure to have your support. So thank you for joining us again. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to one of the British Seat Report team members, uh, Kuljit Tucker, who was involved in putting together the uh, British Seat Report 2020. Um, Kuljit, over to you. Thanks, Jasveer. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kuljit Tucker. I'm a lawyer at uh, Squire Patton Boggs in Birmingham. Um, I've been involved with the British Seek Report for the past couple of years um, in relation to reviewing and analysing the data and then contributing to the report itself. Um, in, the, in relation to the sections that I prepared this year, it was um, dealing with accommodation um, and the arts, but I'll also speak about um, employment and education as well just turning to each section as to what the stats show and also how the data can be used for um, third parties and general sort of government debate and other avenues. Um, so looking at accommodation first, um, the overall respondents, actually 45% of them wholly owned their own properties, whereas 29% actually um, had um, um, had bought their um, properties with a, with assistance of a mortgage. Um, only 11% had been in rented accommodation with 8% being in private landlord accommodation, 2% being with the council as their landlord and 1% within a housing association. 9% um, um, also live rent free, but generally that's seen in more of the younger age groups. Um, possibly living with parents or relatives while studying. Um, in relation to sort of um, how it broke down over the UK, um, there were fewer people um, buying properties with mortgages in the greater southeast London, which includes London, um, the southeast and the eastern regions, whereas there were higher numbers within the rental market, particularly with private landlords. Um, within the Midlands region, that's covering the, the East and West Midlands, um, there were more people that actually owned their own accommodation with fewer people being um, renting accommodation from private landlords. Um, and then the rest, the, the others kind of fell in line with what was the picture across the UK. Now, in terms of how that information can be used um, by third parties, I mean, if, for example, a developer or promotion agents are looking at a particular area, area within where there's a high population of Sikhs, then that demographic will show that they're more likely to purchase a home rather than actually renting. Um, this can be true of um, the current conditions in terms of what the council is proposing and also looking at planning permission, et cetera, as well, um, going forward in terms of the number of properties that are allocated for privately owned and, and housing association and 
just general um, green space as well, because I know that's particularly important to councils and developers in general. Looking at the arts, um, the arts are considered actually to be quite important with the highest interest um, being within sort of film and cinema. Um, that's across all the ages that was um, calculated at about 45%. Uh, also, um, we found that um, Sikh religious paintings were quite high in the, in the arts as well. That was at 30, 37%. Um, also, um, music was quite important. So, um, um, going by Bhangra and Geet, which is at thirty-three percent, compared to other categories, which were sort of art, the arts in terms of sculpture, ceramics, and that kind of things. Those had a much um, lesser, um, you know, interest. Um, but that there's only one or two that had things like graffiti and other abstract paintings. Um, so that. And how that data can be used is ultimately um, obtaining funding from the arts councils. I know that with COVID, it's a very difficult time. So that picture may change over the next few years, but also that can look at looking at diversity within the audience as well as to what types of um, art forms are particularly of interest to the Sikh community, British Sikh community. Just focusing on employment and education as well. Um, so we saw that 79% um, of the respondents um, were employed or self-employed, with the majority being in full-time employment between the ages of 35 and 49 of the age group. Um, these were also broken down into the various sector with the overall majority of the British Sikh community working within the healthcare system. Um, and that was um, consistent across all ages of, of that sector. Um, in terms of the next sector, it was um, teaching and education where it was at 8%, public service was 6%, IT and tech at 6% as well. And then accountancy and professional um, services stroke financial management was at 5%. Um, also the um, generally what we saw was a general picture of what is consistent with other groups within the UK. Um, for example, within the construction industry, we saw that there were more male roles than there were female roles, and that's consistent with our report as well, and just looking at it across the UK. Also, in terms of how this data can be used to assist um, can be lo looked at from a diversity and inclusion point of view, it can be looked at, at social mobility, but also looking at leadership roles as well. And that, that um, information can be broken down further. Um, and if you do need any sort of assistance with that, um, you know, the British Sikh Report team can help with that. Told it. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. And again, it's important for us to recognise that the British Seat Report looks at so many diverse topics. And you've given a good summary of some of the ones that have been looked at. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm now going to pass on. And by the way, if anyone does have any questions, please put them into the Q&A box at the bottom and we'll do our best to answer them at the end of tonight's event. I'm now going to hand over to Jagbeer Jussie Johal. Uh, Jagbeer is, Dr. Jagbeer Jussie Johal is Senior Lecturer in Sikh Studies at the University of Birmingham and she's a contributor to Radio 4's Thought for the Day. Jagbeer. Thank you, Jasper. Um, I'm going to speak about organ donation and look at the ac uh, advocacy that has been done within the community. So, until recently in the United Kingdom, organ donation relied on donors opting in by joining the donor register or a family member consenting to donation when a loved one had died. The Organ Donation Deemed Consent Act 2019, approved by Parliament, which received royal assent on 15th of March 2019, came into effect in England in May 2020. Um, and it changes that. And organ donation in England moved to an opt-out system referred to as Max and Kira's Law, named after Kira Ball and Max Johnson. Kira Ball 9 was killed in a road traffic accident in the summer of 2017. Kira's organs helped four people. Her kidney went to two adults, her liver went to a baby, and her heart went to a nine-year-old Max Johnson, who had heart failure caused by a viral infection. 
Max and his family campaigned in favour of an opt-out system for organ donation. It is hoped that this new legislation will increase and improve the organ donation process so that more lives are benefited and saved. Importantly, England will retain both the opt-in and opt-out register, thereby enabling the public to still register their opt-in organ donation wishes if they wish. Following the publication of the NHS Blood and Transplant Faith and Organ Donation Action Plan, there has been a recognition of the important role that faith-based organisations can play in raising awareness and stimulating debate regarding organ donation. In recent years, members, a number of Sikh faith-based public educated campaigns and donor registration initiatives have played a vital role in trying to improve the uptake of registering for organ donation in the Sikh community. And has Sikh celebrated the 550th birth anniversary of Guru Nanak in 2019, it coincided with a remarkable year of activism promoting organ donation within the community. Guru Nanak's teachings, which emphasize spiritual wisdom, righteous living and responsibility towards God and his creation, have been embraced to advocate for organ donation. Guru Nanak advocated for a sense of duty and way of life achieved through practicing three core principles, Nam Japana, recitation of God's name, Geet Ganna, earning an honest living, and Van Shakana, selfless service. These core practices are both internal and external practices that enable spiritual growth and facilitate moral and ethical living. They emphasize an individual's social responsibility to ensure the well being of society. As discussed in the British Sikh Report 2019, the last core teaching of Van Shakana is most important here to highlight how the Sikh teachings should be seen as a strong advocate for organ donation because Sikhs fundamentally believe that the body and organs are simply mechanisms to allow the eternal soul to experience life during this stage of existence. Sikh teachings place great emphasis on seva and altruism and Sikhs engage in three forms of selfless service seva. Seva rendered through one's body, than seva rendered through one's mind, man, and seva rendered through giving of one's material wealth, dan. While all three forms of seva are considered equally important, the Sikh Guru stressed that all seva should be a labor of love, performed without desire, nishkam, without intention, nishkbat, and with humility, nimrata. In 2019, to mark the 550th birth anniversary of Guru Nanak, and most recently in 2020, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen countless Sikhs all over the world carrying out volunteer charity work with their ethos firmly embedded within the Sikh philosophy and entirely consistent with the service of donating organs to give life to others and alleviate suffering. Now this advocacy has been seen through individual focus campaigns, organization campaigns and Godwara campaigns. Now, in terms of individual campaigns, what we have seen are campaigns run on social media or at Godwaras, such as a kidney for Simran, match for Mina, swab for Hajj. Um, but the most influential and successful campaign has been Hope for Anaya, and Sandy will be speaking about that in a minute. In terms of charities and wider campaigns, one of the most um, uh, uh, prominent one has been Mandit Mudder, the Memorial Foundation, and work done by British Sikh nurses. And Rohit will speak about his work um, uh, in a few minutes as well. Now, through the support of NHSBT Community Investment Scheme, the Man Mandit Mudda Memorial Foundation, British Sikh nurses and City Sikhs in 2019 were able to work together successfully to bring the issue to the forefront of the community's attention and promote organ donation. They developed and used a hashtag organ server to support Sikhs in exploring the seva aspect of organ donation. Now, Godwaras have also played a very prominent role in, in talking about the issue. In 2019, Siri Guru Singh Sabha Southall and Sikh Welfare and Research Trust engaged in an organ donation campaign with NHS blood transport, transplant support. Harmeet Gill, a trustee at the, the Godwara, described how on 12th of November, to mark the 550th birth anniversary of Guru Nanak, his Godwara decided to do something different in the UK, which would have an everlasting legacy. Taking on board the legacy of Guru Nanak and all the Sikh Gurus who devoted their lives to humanity and sacrificed their lives for the welfare of others, 
they decided to start a conversation amongst the community to dispel the fears, myths, and misinformation that surrounds organ donation. Now, Godwara Nanak Darbar, uh, Guru Nanak Darbar Godwara Gravesend has created a community engagement and well-being team, um, which has also been promoting organ donation since 2017. In conclusion, it's important to note that guided by a wish to relieve suffering, a sense of altruism and love for social action, younger members of the community have become very proactive in their advocacy for organ donation. They have recognized the role that the Godwara can play in educating the community on important issues. And this is their seva via man, mind. Providing such knowledge and education is altruistic and selfless because it benefits the whole community. As young leadership positions, <coughs> sorry, within the Godwara has become um, more open, they will become important influencers in the debate because they recognize the impact of chronic conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, and hyper hypertension, which may result um, in the need for a transplant. The above campaigns uh, highlight the positive outcome of collaborating with community and religious leaders and their organizations to influence and educate a community about organ donation. It is clear that religious initiatives, especially when facilitated by religious organizations, can really add value in raising the community's understanding of the life-giving benefits of organ, blood, and tissue donation, especially when this is done utilizing Sikh values such as seva and their compassion, and in turn, improve, improving the health outcomes of the community. Importantly, these examples provide a template for developing trust between the government and local communities, which is even more important in the context of the Black Lives Matter and the current COVID-19 pandemic. All of the SEEK initiatives have been under, underpinned by building trust, using a trusted community space, working with trusted messengers, such as SEEK donor families, health professionals, SEEK researchers, and religious and community leaders. For SEEKs, it also, for Sikhs, there is also another important message that they need to consider, which is that as we, as we have these conversations of organ donation, they have also led to follow up conversations on other health conditions that may lead to the need for organ donation in the future, i.e. heart disease, obesity and diabetes. In light of this, maybe it is time for Godwaras to reflect on how they can help improve their congregation's health i.e. help reduce people's cholesterol and blood pressure levels through re reducing sugar and salt in food and increasing fruit and vegetable consumption in the longer provided. Whilst these are difficult conversations, it is clear that there is a growing advocacy within the community for change when it comes to health matters, and this can be harnessed. Now, thank you. Jack Bear, thank you so much. And thank you for highlighting the, uh, the main issue that we are going to be discussing today which is that of organ donation and the impacts that uh, the uh, that has had uh, upon the Sikh community and also the statistics and the awareness. Uh, I'm very mindful of the time so I'm going to um, without any further ado move on to Gertrude Rundava to say a, a few short words about uh, the um, issue itself. Uh, Professor Gertrude Rundava is a professor of diversity and public health and director of the Institute for Health Research at the University of Bedfordshire. Gertrude. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, firstly, let me just um, congratulate everybody at the British Seek Report and the fantastic volunteers for this amazing document. I think, you know, in any good uh, report, you want to see three key ingredients. Uh, and I say this as a, a public health uh, professor. The first is you want good quality data because the data will enable you to make good decisions. Um, and I'd like to congratulate the whole team for the way they collected this data, analysed it and presented it so articulately and accurately. Um, I think the second point is, which is wonderful to see, is you've touched upon such a range of issues that impact upon the whole life course. So issues such as disability, housing, employment, um, ageing, and all of these issues are so important. So, you know, um, as uh, Jigby has uh, so well said, you know, a lot of these issues are preventable if we take some careful measures throughout our, our life. Um, and my final point is we do have to think about the wider determinants agenda. Too often we get too fixed with 
healthcare and health services. And I think, you know, um, our housing, our employment and our life decisions do impact upon our health and social care. So I, I would urge everybody to really reflect uh, upon how they do uh, sort of make their decisions on a daily basis, because I think that's really important. Um, so I'd like to congratulate you all. Um, I'll just share one nugget from for you to consider and ponder. Across the world, there are many countries now that are creating these initiatives, such as health promoting churches, um, whereby those places of worship do become the sort of community champions of positive mental health and positive physical health. And I don't see any reason why Godwaras couldn't emulate that practice and become health promoting Godwaras. And there are many people who could uh, support this endeavor and I'd be delighted to support any Godwara would be interested. Thank you. Gertz, thank you for that. And that's certainly a good challenge to, uh, to put back to the community. Uh, health focused Godwaras, ones which champion health, that's certainly something that we would encourage and we hope that some of our attendees will be able to take that back to their respective Godwaras. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to ask Rohit Sagu to say, say a few words. Rohit is a lecturer in children's nursing at City University of London and he is a founder of the British Sikh Nurses. Rohit. Thank you, Jack Beer, and thank you to the BSR team for such wonderful work that you've done as well over the last few years, highlighting many issues within the Sikh community as well. Um, obviously, from the perspective of organ donation, I just want to bring up um, the fact that the Sikh faith stresses the importance of noble deeds, and one of our noble deeds within the Sikh teachings is seva, um, and one of that actions of seva is obviously Sikhs believe in, you know, the after death is a continuous cycle, so the physical body isn't needed, so therefore, you know, organ donation is um, highlighted within the Sikh faith as well. It's mostly important that I really want to drive a conversation as British Sikh nurses do, is that function of um, the discourse that we need to have within organ, about organ donation and dispel the myths that are associated with organ donation as well. And it's the greatest advantage of this, you know, discussion of organization with Sikh families is the sense, you know, the sense of strength and networks that we have that bind the Sikh community. Um, and this discourse around organ donation and within this network uh, uh, network is considerably profitable when engaging with the Sikh community as well. So um, having said that, you know, one of the key drivers that we have is not just now for um, organ donation, those who are looking for deceased donor donors, but it's also the drive for those who are looking for living donors, donors as well, such as highlighting um, cases such as a, a kidney for Bali, who's um, looking for a, a living donor. And so I think we really need to look our efforts in terms of ju not just organ donation, also blood donation, stem cell donation of what you've highlighted, some cases of stem cell donation. So this is a broad spectrum of donations that we need to highlight and bring to fruition within the Sikh community. Um, and I'd lastly just like to say, please, with your loved ones, have that conversation. It's really important. Thank you. Right. Thank you for your impassioned uh, approach there. And I think you're quite right. It is important for us to be having these discussions with friends, with family, with our loved ones. And we hope that the British Sikh report this year will allow people, the attendees, to start having those conversations with their loved ones. Now, talking of loved ones, I'm sure that if any of you were in a situation where you had uh, a family member or someone that you loved who needed to have an organ donation, you would work with them and you would do your best to campaign for that. We're really privileged to be joined today by Sandy Shoker, who was completely in that situation. She's an organ donation activist and campaigner, and she was heavily involved in the Hope for Anaya campaign. I'm now going to ask Sandy to say a few words. Sandy. Lovely, thanks. Can you make me host, please, just here? You can share your screen without having to become a host. Okay, thank you. Okay, can everybody see the picture of a beautiful Eli there? Okay, great. Okay, um, just to advise you, there is some emotive content in the presentation tonight. So if, you, if you're going to be impacted, then it might be time to, to step away. Um, just want to share the story of um, um, Hope for Anaya. Um, it was a popular, popular topic over the last two years, so you may already be familiar with it. Um, 
thank you firstly to, for the invitation tonight to continue to spread the message. Um, when we last attended the event, we had announced, we were able to announce that Anaya's um, donor had been found and we were in the build up to transplant. I just want to speak a little bit about our experience. So Anaya's a two year old born with a rare and complex kidney condition um, and she was on dialysis for quite a long time. Unfortunately, her parents weren't able to donate because Anaya had had a number of blood transfusions which rendered them incompatible. And the search was on um, to give Anaya a living donor um, to give her the best chance possible of an, a normal, long and happy life. Um, a quick timeline there, but um, I appreciate the rush of time, but you can see um, pictures of Anaya during key moments um, um, of her life. Um, as you can see, she struggled quite a bit. Um, but this is the most integral point um, part of the campaign in, in August 18, when the parents were told they were no longer a match. Um, and our work began within days, really. Um, and there were some ups and downs during that time, but you can see here the picture of Anaya on the morning of her transplant, not knowing what uh, awaited her. Um, and the final picture on this slide is Anaya post-transplant, a happy, healthy baby full of life. Um, in terms of mobilising a campaign, it was a huge learning curve for us as family and friends. Many of us took, were new to this landscape. Um, we were very much reliant on personal contacts and we had some great support from, as you can imagine, NHS Open Donation, but also individuals such as Professor Gertrude and Jawa here, Vichy Seat Nurses uh, and the British Seat Report. But we also made use of community events and the Griffith Firms Wedding Fairs at Convarts, going to Gordwaras, musical concerts, school fairs, Diwali events, at, at Gurburg, um, and so on. Um, and we campaigned from Glasgow to Gravesend, um, and also using the mainstream seat channels um, in terms of television and, and radio stations. Basically, we were leaving no, no stone unturned. And whilst Anaya's campaign did carry the picture of Anaya, it really did carry the message of organ donation, both living and post-life, um, for the betterment um, of us as a community and to make sure that anybody waiting um, could hopefully receive a, a transplant in a decreased time period. And that's common with a kidney for Simran and a kidney for Bali. Um, all families campaign on behalf of everybody else. Some visuals there of some of the events that we carried out. So as you can see, it was very much about being prominent and, and being visible. Um, and the good thing is, is that the story was picked up by the mainstream press. So in December, front page news on the mirror, that picture there is Anaya meeting her donor for the very first time. Um, and as you can see, they were on this morning to evening. So a really positive message of a Sikh donor um, donating to a Sikh family and hopefully getting that message home uh, that living, do living donation is an option. It's a, it's a healthy choice to make but also um, reinforcing that it, it is permissible within the seat phase. In terms of the experience, we did get a lot of positive feedback. Many of our um, fellow seats were already registered often when they applied for driving licenses. The most positive experience was when we met people who said, I've been meaning to sign up, let me do that today. And then equally people saying, let me take that information away. We are seeing the change in, in the Godwaras being open to this dialogue. And it, you have to be honest, at times there were challenges because in some places this topic was new to them and there was some resistance. And that's probably due to the age of some of the people on the committee and the younger members moving up the ranks there, um, probably see a more positive outcome there. It showed that this is a dialogue that's much needed in our community. It's a topic that a lot of people are uncomfortable with and misguidedly feel that it's not part of the religion, but we've heard a lot today about how it is permissible and it supports the tenets of our faith. And a lot of people did turn around and say that they didn't want to donate. A very positive campaign, really proud to be associated um, with the NIA's um, campaign. Um, we did see 35 potential donors come forward, which is unheard of, um, and I think it had a really positive impact for post-life donation as well. In terms of lessons learned, we need to move forward and continue to proactively address this issue and open the doors to discussion at every point possible. Um, as Dr. Dutty Johar said, this, we need to incorporate the message into our, our faith and encourage families to discuss this because the, the family still holds an important decision at that fragile point. And we need to make sure that people are educated on both the law and the ethics of organ donation and, and dispel any myths that are that might exist. 
And the big point here is that we need to remove this burden from families when they are at their point of desperation. So when they're having to campaign, they're losing time with their loved ones. And that's a common issue with stem cell and blood donation. And the final message tonight is it's up to us to change it. So I'd encourage everybody here tonight to come forward. Um, you're happy to, happy to take questions on Hope for an Eye on social media platforms or to speak to any one of us around how you, around your decisions and, and perhaps how you can support the donation. Thank you. Sandy, thank you so much for that. Uh, again, it's so helpful to, to have individuals such as yourself who've been so actively involved in campaigning with regards to organ, organ donors for uh, individuals. Uh, it's wonderful to have that sense of solidarity as a community. And as you've said, having a Sikh donor for a Sikh, Sikh young, young child, um, it's just so heartwarming. And let's hope that this does encourage those conversations to take place with uh, with others as they really should be. Uh, I'm now going to uh, ask uh, Jigbev to uh, just answer a couple of the questions which have been put, uh, put on our Q&A. Thank you again for your questions. And then we'll bring this to an end in a very short space of time. Jigbev. Thank you. Um, Jigtar Singh is asked about whether the since the inception of the BSR, there's been a marked shift in political party voting by Sikhs. And um, that's not a question that I think we've asked for, uh, certainly not in recent years since I've been involved. So this is uh, the first time we're asking it. So I'm not sure whether we can answer that yet, but we'll certainly keep monitoring it from now to the future. Um, but what the this year's question do show is that different by age group. And I suspect that that gives some sort of a hint, I think, that there is a sort of trend there. Um, there, there are a few questions from Parminder Singh Bhinti um, about disability, and uh, that's such a key issue. I quite agree with you. Some of the questions we've already answered in the chat, um, but uh, I, I think I know uh, how keen you are as a campaigner on this issue and also working with the Sikh Assembly. This is something that we do want to tackle, just to give a plug that... Um, um, the Sikh Assembly has got an e event in, uh, on 10th of December um, on disability, on which we're also going to present more analysis from the BSR related to that topic. Um, so yes, please keep an eye out for that one. And in, in the process of that, we, we can uh, look at more issues and throw some more light on uh, the issue of disability and how it impacts particularly on Sikhs. Another question had just come in from Bal Atwal. Fully agree in support campaign around blood and organ donation. Uh, description teaching. Okay, oh, that one I think possibly Jagbir can answer. Sorry, what was the question? Uh, fully agree and support the campaign around blood and organ donation. It would be great if we can find direct scripture and teaching to really show to all generations that it's something we can all support. I mean, the Jagbir's article this year and last year does cover some of that, but I'll let you say a few yeah. words about it. So I, I have used um, quotes from um, the Guru Granth Sahib in the report this year and in 2019. So please um, have a, re a re refer to those, but if there's anything specific you want to talk to me about, um, I will try and locate those. But also it's uh, interesting to kind of look at what is said within the Rith Mariadha um, about um, various kind of these kinds of issues. Thank you. Thank you, Jag uh, Jagbe, and thank you, Jagbe, for that. Uh, if there are any other questions or anything that people wish to raise, you can always send us an email. Uh, it's info at britishseekreport.org. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the speakers this evening, Jagdev Singh Virdi, uh, Kuljet Thakka, Pat McFadden MP, uh, Gertrude Dava, Jack Bejati Johal, Rohit Zagu, and Sandy Shoka. But most importantly, I wanted to thank all of you for joining us this evening, for engaging with the British Seat Report in this way. We hope that you're able to take this report and share it with your friends and family, to be able to have those conversations that have been mentioned by many of our speakers tonight about talking about organ donation and becoming an organ donor if you so wish to. Thank you to all of you for joining us and we look forward to um, presenting more of our findings and research in, in time to come. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.